this knowledge, uh, the maternal age itself only have the sensitivity of only 30% to detect the Down syndrome. So it's not good enough to, to as a screening tool. So that is why with the uh, additional methods of bio biomarkers from the maternal serum, it can increase up to 50% uh, together with the maternal age. So it's still not a good enough as a screening tool. So that is why and causing a higher risk of amniocentesis procedures itself. So that is why in 1980s, um, there is a doctor which is a radiologist. Uh, she's a radiologist which named Dr. Beryl Benesarif. Sarif. She's actually, there's um, some interesting uh, stories about Dr. Barry Bonasarov, whereby she's actually a dyslexic. And she has the difficulty to get herself um, to be at par, to pass a, a, an entrance exam. And she did a lot of things to uh, adapt with her dyslexia. Like she or always count number of the students so that she know when she needs to read the paragraph. And then she, during her sophomore years, she paid other people to actually type for her and she just dictate what to be typed. Uh, and then she gets into the medical schools uh, with the help of her father, which is also a Nobel Prize uh, physician at that time. But what is important about this is that she thinks dyslexia is a, a gift for her because she can see what other typical human can't see, like a lung mass, a knuckle translucency. So she's the one who found about the translucency that can be seen in 11 to 13 plus 6 days with the CRL around 80, sorry, 45 to 84 millimeter, millimeter when she found out about the knuckle translucency uh, and measured it. So there, there is a graph that can tell us about the risk if the graph is more than 95 centile, there is a high risk of the um, anomaly, fetal anomaly. And since there is a graph, but we can always take a range. If uh, the NT is around 1.8 to 2.35, then we can consider it to be normal. If you get something more than 5 millimeter, then it's fairly very thick. And further investigations need to be, need to be done, which is the amniocentesis or uh, CBS. So that is how in 1980s. But usually the anti can be done at as early as 11 to 13 weeks. Uh, and the emission disease can be done at 15 weeks. So people still investigate further. And um, in our recent years, 1990s, we have uh, a scientist from... CUHK, a Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is Dr. Dennis Lo. So Dr. Dennis Lo is the first person who actually talks about the cell-free fetal DNAs. And he, he's a biochemist, biotechnologist. So by 2011, there is a available um, cell-free fetal DNA in the market as a screening for fetal anomaly, which this actually can be done as early as 10 weeks, earlier than the knuckle translucency with the very good uh, sensitivity of 99%. And by uh, 10 weeks, usually there is a 10% of fetal fraction in the maternal serum. So the, the self fetal DNA is only by taking the maternal serum. And even with minimal rate of 4% of uh, fetal fractions DNA in the maternal serum, always can be used for the detections of the fetal anomaly, the cro chromosomal abnormality. So that is for the history. So now let's move on to, uh, and I forget to mention about the most important uh, scientists in our, our era today, which is Dr. Kipros Nicolaides. Kipros Nicolaides. He's a Greek uh, scientist which works in London and he actually described about the pyramids of the antenatal uh, fallout 
but I'll describe it later. But let's go to the what basically the testing and also the diagnostic uh, that we can do in the first and second trimester. So first trimester and second trimester. As you can see in the history, So, as you can see in the history, we advocate uh, to do dating scan at 7 to 13 weeks. So, anything above this, we have to do the B BPD for the dating scan. And at 11 to 13 weeks plus 6 days, just like I've mentioned earlier, we can start to use the knuckle translucency and um, the knuckle translucency, basically, um, if we only take a maternal age as the risk, we can get 30% sensitivity. If we add age with the biomarkers, then we can get 50% of sensitivity. If we take age plus the biomarkers, uh, markers, uh, plus the NT, we can get as higher as 85%. Sorry for that. So 85%. But if if we only take H into consideration with the knuckle translucency, it drops to 70% of sensitivity. Now, if we want to increase further the sensitivity, what we can do is we add the H plus the knuckle translucency plus the knuckle bone, at, um, nasal bone, sorry, knuckle translucency, nasal bone, and also the BHCG, the biomarker, which is the beta HCG, and also PEP A. This will increase up to 95%. And if you do um, doctor's venesis alone, you can get a sensitivity of 80% to detect fetal anomaly. So basically, um, let's talk about what, what can we have here. So beta HCG, let's start with the PEP-A. Because PEP-A is during the first trimester together with this. You called it a combined test. So with the PEP-A, beta HCG. So we can add uh, AFP, alpha fetoprotein. And we have the estriol and also inhibin A. So let's draw the so the risk of uh, Down syndrome. My God, eighteen. So let's compare the trisomy and also uh, Edward. So in Pap A, both will be reduced. And HCG uh, in Down syndrome will increase, and Pata will reduce. Basically, Pata will reduce everything. But uh, Down syndrome, um, the FP will be reduced, and uh, the SRI also reduce, but the inhibin A will be increased. So let's just sketch this. So this is how you can differentiate with uh, Pata from the biomarkers. And if we think of um, the, uh, for example, there is a, what we call a integrated uh, studies during the first trimester. So if you think of IUGR, usually the PAP-A also will be reduced. And if we talk about the spina bifida, the alpha fetoprotein usually, okay, the alpha fetoprotein usually be, will be high in spina bifida and also Neurological neural tube disease. Okay, that is for the biomarkers. So, um, as you can see, this can be done at 13 weeks plus 6 days. So now, what can we do after we have these uh, suspicions? If the patient is uh, have a positive results, then you can send either for, uh, for diagnostics, diagnostic tests, which currently available um, CVS, which can be done uh, as early as 11 weeks. And also we have the amniocentesis, sorry, 13 weeks. 13 weeks, yeah. And amniocentesis. 
at 15 weeks. So now if let's say you've diagnosed this at 13 weeks, you can straight away uh, do CVS, which carries the same miscarriage risk of 1%. Mm, but there are some limitations in the CVS because sometimes you can have a uh, what you call a confined placental placenta mosaicism whereby you have the mosaicism in the placental tissue but a normal fetus and amniocentesis whereby you can you uh, or you can wait another two weeks but you will have a delay in the diagnosis and also the the management which is the top will be delayed as well and it's a torture for a woman to wait for two weeks to really get the diagnostic test to be done and wait further for the results of this amniocentesis ready so uh, either either way you can do uh, amniocentesis with carrying the same risk of miscarriage of 1% in relates to the procedures and if attempt attempt of uh, to do amniocentesis earlier than 15 weeks usually it will relate with the congenital talipus uh, respiratory morbidity so basically uh, you don't do it earlier because of the other risk um, okay so that is for the amniocentesis. But uh, what I want to highlight in today's video is actually what really the amniocentesis can do. Oh, but before that, let's talk about the second trimester. So in 15 to 18 weeks, you can send this, um, the, other, the other biomarkers that we have mentioned here. Uh, serum biomarker. as a screening and then at 18 20 weeks plus six day you can do uh, what we call a genetic ultrasound to really look at the one the we want to look at the structural defects or you we can look at the soft markers as well so at this point, we call it a genetic ultrasound at uh, 18 to 20 weeks. That is why Dr. Nicholas, uh, Dr. Kipros Nicolaitis uh, advocate to use this pyramid of antenatal care, whereby previously we only see patients, very minimal patients at 12 weeks, and then we follow up further, ask them to come at 16 weeks, and then we ask them to come again at 20 weeks, 24 weeks, and 28 weeks and after 24 weeks we want to review the patients more frequent so at 30 32 weeks 34 weeks 36 weeks and then 38 weeks so every fortnightly we want to review the patients so the burden of the uh, specialist will be increased as the pregnancy goes but with the advance in the first trimester and second trimester screening, with the help of NIPT that we have nowadays, which can be done as uh, during the first trimester, NIPT can be done at 10 weeks. So basically, we can reduce the number of the patients in our clinics. So we have to screen all patients at 12 weeks, at uh, as early as the first trimester, 7 to 13 weeks, so 12 weeks. And then we see them back somewhere in 16 weeks 16 weeks from there we can get um, two group of patients to be seen at 20 weeks or 16 and under specialist care under phytometanol care from 16 weeks to 32 weeks after after the screening at 20 weeks basically we can space out uh, we can review the patient at 37 weeks because we have excluded the risk of IGR. We have started the management for, if let's say, preeclampsia. And then we know whether the uh, fetus is healthy or no er as early as 20 weeks. And then by 37, we have lesser patients to uh, look for and at 41 uh, weeks. So this is actually more um, cost effective for the country especially in developing countries with limited resources. 
So I want to talk about what amniocentesis can do, actually. So as we know, previously, we used the gym sustaining. So it's a standard karyotyping, whereby um, after the metaphase analysis, analysis of the chromosome, we can see a standard karyotype that is really seen. So this actually can detect uh, an aploidy. Um, deletion and actually it can detect uh, up to 3 mega base the nuclide base so that is why due to this limitation so for example you have a patient with a normal uh, karyotype but there is a micro deletion site you can see in the Kridusha which is micro deletions of uh, 5p right and then you have a DeGeorge. Uh, as for DeGeorge, they have a micro deletion at uh, chromosome 22Q, the, the long arm. And then you have a Prada Wheelie, for example, a micro deletion at uh, 55, uh, 15, sorry, 15Q, Prada Wheelies. So for this micro deletions, my point, we, it, it usually can be missed during a standard karyotype. So that is why there is another uh, studies that can be done for this. So another methods of um, analyzing these DNA is called FISH or you call it uh, fluorescent sense inside to hybrid hybridizations so fish basically can uh, detect on this micro deletions and also the uh, un unbalanced translocation and um, it can detect both balanced and unbalanced translocations micro deletions but there is a problem with the uh, fish as well it can detect only up to one to two uh, mega base so it's smaller than the uh, standard karyotype but it's still not enough to detect other smaller micro deletions that um, can have a severe outcome to the patient and also for the fish we have to know which bait to use just like you're fishing you have to have a specific type of bait uh, that used. So you have to know, for example, you have a patient with cystic fibrosis, you already know about the uh, micro deletions of the 508 codon, then you can, you can send for fish. But if let's say you have a skeletal dysplasia uh, with a shock long bones patient, uh, you want to know whether it's a lethal or non-lethal uh, skeletal dysplasia, you cannot send fish because there's a lot of other... There is a lot of syndromes that associate with the short long bones. So fish is not the best modalities to send. So due to that, there is another um, progress in the analysis of the genes, which uh, we call it as a CMA, or it's a microarray, or uh, array CGH, which is a comparative genomic hybridization so basically um, CGH, CGH is something that you know there is a micro deletion you have suspicions of micro deletions but you're not sure which particularly micro deletions or duplications that you want to look at so you have to send this uh, comparative genomic hybridizations so it can analyze further and this can detect actually one to up to one kilo base so even smaller as compared to the fish so this probably uh, solutions for uh, for a disease like skeletal dysplasia or tenetophoric skeletal dysplasia and then um, nowadays we are talking about the NGS which is the new generation sequencing which is they sequence the DNA DNA sequencing. There is a lot of technique use. Previously, before NGS, uh, people used to do the whole genomic uh, sequencing, which uh, used the Sanger uh, sequencing. 
but it's very it's not cost effective it's very expensive to analyze and takes a longer time so that's why now we have a small fractions of the dna that can be analyzed and uh, compare with the uh, reference so we have a ngs new generation sequencing new generation So this actually can detect uh, even smaller than the uh, CGH. So I think that's all.